Hi and welcome. For all parents, a child going missing must be the hardest thing in the world to deal with. The chance of abduction and not knowing where the child is must be unbearable. All parents have experienced extreme panic felt when they lose sight of their child. But for some, this turns into a living nightmare when their child simply doesn't come home. This is the tragic story of Holly Maria Jones, who went missing from her home in May, 2003. I must state that this story may be upsetting for some people, as this is the most heartbreaking story I have researched. Viewer discretion is advised. In today's video, we're going over to Canada and to the city of Toronto. Toronto is the largest city in Canada, the capital of the Canadian province of Ontario, and has a population of around 6 million people. In Toronto, you can walk back in time and visit the 18th century Gothic castle at Casa Loma, or view the iconic CN Tower with its 360 degree views of Toronto. Toronto is known as one of the most vibrant cities in Canada. The first people to live in Toronto were the native Indians who named it Tacaranto, which translates to trees grow in shallow water. It would go on to be colonized by the French and the British before gaining independence as a part of Canada in 1867. It was in the city of Toronto that a beautiful happy young girl named Holly Jones lived. Holly Jones was brought home from the hospital in a little flowery dress after she was born on September the 14th. 1992, by parents Maria Jones and George Stonehouse. She had a loving home, and was the youngest of four children, her older siblings, Sean, Natasha and James doted on her. She was a loving, gentle, and energetic little girl, who loved music, and had dreams of becoming a singer one day. Holly excelled at school. She was very popular and a good student, she also loved sports, playing basketball and cross-country running. But above everything, Holly had a special relationship with her mother, being the baby of the family, Maria cherished her youngest daughter. On Monday the 12th of May, 2003, Holly had a play date with her best friend Claudia, and after spending the late afternoon doing homework and playing games, Holly volunteered to walk her home. Holly was normally shy, but was growing independence in her approaching adolescence, she was eager to show her maturity. It was only a short distance from where Holly lived, and was the same route she walked to school. The pair set off towards Claudia's house, and upon seeing her home, Holly headed back to her parents. It was just a 15-minute walk to her parents' house, a route that would take her along a busy road, in a low-crime area. Holly set off at 6pm, when it was still daylight, but when darkness fell and she still wasn't home, her parents began to worry. This was totally out of character for Holly, who was always home before her nighttime curfew, and would always inform her parents if she was going to a friend's house. Her parents went out along the route Holly had taken, then visited the places Holly would normally play, but she was nowhere to be seen. Holly's parents contacted the police, and within hours of her disappearance, police launched a massive search which involved approximately 300 people. They issue an Amber Alert, a quick response strategy used when a child's kidnapping is suspected. Residents of the neighborhood set up search teams, and all through the night a relentless search was made for Holly. The next morning, Holly's parents Maria Jones and George Stonehouse make a heartbreaking appeal to the public for her safe return. Holly, Holly, honey, our hearts are out to you. Baby, if you can hear me, you know how much we love you. I feel you inside of me and I'm trying to find you. I'm doing everything. Everybody's working very hard. And whoever has her, I beg you, I beg you with all my heart that you keep her and bring her home to her mother and father. You keep her safe, I beg you. She hasn't ever hurted anyone in her life. She's a happy girl. I beg you not to hurt her. Bring her home to us. Please, don't make her sad. Thank you. The emotion is uh, pretty evident. We're all very concerned for Holly's safety. We're doing everything we can 
We're not leaving any stone unturned to try and locate uh, this 10-year-old girl. Sadly, a few hours after the appeal was made, a man walking his dog along Toronto Island spotted a bag floating in the lake. He pulled the bag in, and inside were human remains. When police arrived, they quickly found another bag, containing more body parts. The first bag contained a child's head and arms. The second bag contained a child's torso. The remains found in the bags were identified as little Hollies, and the police said. The search for Holly Jones is now a search for her killer. Whoever killed Holly, had dismembered her body, put her in some travel bags, and placed dumbbells in to weigh them down, before throwing them into Lake Ontario. Police divers continued to scour the area for any further evidence, or body parts. The next day, on May the 15th, police launched an appeal to the public, and show them the clothes Holly was wearing on the day of her disappearance, hoping that it would jog someone's memory. They also ask for the help of identifying two men that were traveling on board a ferry bound for Toronto Island, the place where some of Holly's remains were discovered. One of the men came forward and was quickly ruled out as a suspect, the other man was never identified. Police released posters of the two bags and dumbbells used by the killer that were recovered from the lake hoping somebody would recognize them. The hotline received more than 1,650 calls, with thousands of possible leads, but unfortunately with little success. Although Toronto Police Inspector Gary Ellis stated, they thought they had committed the perfect crime, they thought they had done a textbook case, and what they've done, is provide us with a substantial amount of evidence. Holly was laid to rest on the 20th of May, at St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Church. The service was broadcast outside the church, for the hundreds of supporters, that had come to pay their respects to Holly. Also in attendance, were the Ontario Premier, the Toronto Mayor, and the Chief of Police. Holly's murder, had gained the attention of the media, and the people of Canada were outraged, the police quickly became under pressure to find whoever had committed this atrocity. The search for little Holly's killer, would become the biggest manhunt ever undertaken in the city of Toronto. The day after Holly's funeral, police started sifting through thousands of garbage bags, in the hope of finding something that would help them in the case. Police would check the sex offenders register, and it was revealed that over 200 convicted sex offenders lived in the immediate area. They all needed to be ruled out one by one, it was a painstaking task, but all were eventually cleared. 2,500 homes were searched in the area, hoping to flush out the killer. They also started collecting DNA samples from all males that lived in the area, close to where Holly lived. Holly's neighborhood was put on high alert, after there were more reports of attempted child abduction cases around the area. On June 2, a man was seen leading a young boy out of a grocery store, in Holly's neighborhood. When the child's mother realizes, she chases after the man, who quickly releases the boy and runs off. A few days later, a man grabbed an eight-year-old girl's wrist, as she walked along the road with her mother, and tried to drag her away. There was absolutely no way the mother was letting go of her daughter, and after a struggle he was not going to win, the man sprints away before he could be caught. Thanks to the actions of the children's mothers, both of the attempted abductions failed. At this point, worried residents even start patrolling the streets in a bid to keep the children of the area safe. Holly's school increases its security, and the principal brings in social workers for students, who are anxious about the increased police presence in the neighborhood. In an attempt to get everyone's DNA, police told people that their DNA would only be tested against the Holly case, once it was tested and ruled out, their DNA profile would be destroyed, and not kept on file. After the police concluded their DNA testing of all the males in Holly's neighborhood, everyone was ruled out although there were several men who wouldn't take part in the program, and refused to give police a DNA sample. There were two in particular, that they decided to take a closer look at. The first man was placed under surveillance, and was seen leaving his house with a holdall, similar to the one that Holly's remains were found in. They followed the man to a house, where the man left the bag with the occupants, and returned home. Police obtained a search warrant for the house, thinking the bag contained more of Holly's remains, but when they searched the house, then the bag, they found it contained seven pounds of marijuana. 
Not the result the police wanted, but quite a find. He was quickly ruled out of committing Holly's murder though, having a solid alibi. The second man in question was a 35-year-old software developer named Michael Briere. When officers arrived at Briere's house to test his DNA, they noticed a bath mat with the similar colored fibers that were found on Holly's body. The house also had a lot of cleaning products in it and smelled of bleach. Suspicion immediately fell on Briere when he refused to give a DNA sample, and as he had no prior criminal convictions, there was no DNA record on file. So investigators had to follow him until they seen him do something that could possibly leave his DNA. Detectives got a break when they observed him drinking out of a can of soda, then throwing it in a public bin. Police officers waited until Briere had left the area, then recovered the can from the bin, and immediately sent it away for DNA testing. When the results came back, the DNA that was found under Holly's fingernails was a perfect match to Michael Briere's. Michael Briere was born in the Rosemount district of Montreal in 1968. He was the offspring from an alcoholic mother and a father who was a married man who wanted nothing to do with his new son. Throughout his youth, Michael would be abused in every way by his alcoholic mother and he grew up with very little self-esteem and thought very little of himself. Michael dreamed of being a famous actor, he took acting lessons, but his acting career never took off, because, well because he was fucking ugly. He underwent cosmetic surgery to try to improve his looks, but after looking at his photo, I'd say it was a complete waste of money. He started to take theatre classes, where he would meet his future wife Vicky Bolduc. The pair had a whirlwind romance, and would go to Las Vegas to get married, although the marriage wouldn't last long, she put up with him for just over two years. She said before the wedding, Michael Briere was a charmer, and a bodybuilder. Immediately afterwards, he became a couch potato and a computer geek, obsessed with slasher films. In 2003, at the time of the abduction, he lived in Toronto at 1450 Bloor Street West. Police quickly arrested Briere, and while under interrogation and faced with the DNA evidence, he confessed to the murder of Holly Jones. He claimed that after watching disgusting movies involving children, he happened to walk outside, just as Holly was passing his home. The decision he made next would ultimately end the life of Holly. What this monster did to this poor child was awful to read, and I don't think anyone would want to hear it, so I will not be documenting it in this story. He then hid her body in a refrigerator, before dismembering her body with a hacksaw, and over the next three days began dumping her body parts around the area. Some went into the harbor, and others went into the garbage bins. He claims Holly's legs will never be found, because the garbage was collected the day after he placed her legs in the bin. Police chief, Julian Fantino, told a news conference that Michael Briere, aged 35, has been charged with first-degree murder and placed into protective custody without bail. Hopefully this arrest will bring some closure to Holly's family, friends, and the community as a whole. On the 17th of June 2004, Briere pleaded guilty to the murder of Holly Jones, which he then described as cruel, inhuman, and nightmarish. He claims he wished to spare his victim's family the pain of a trial. Oh, how very noble of him. He received an automatic life sentence and will not be eligible for parole for 25 years. This poor excuse for a human being, piece of shit, will be eligible for parole when he is 60 years old, he murders and dismembers an innocent child, and there is a chance he will walk the streets again. I think the Canadian government needs to address this, he will always be a danger to children as long as he breathes. In court, he blamed his actions on viewing totally disgusting movies, but he must have searched for them, or bought them, because that sort of content isn't readily available on normal internet, or at your local blockbuster. This is such a sad story of a young girl, who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but I think if it wasn't her, then this monster would have done the same to some other child. Luckily the police were thorough, and worked tirelessly in their investigation, which got him off the streets before he struck again, which I have no doubt he would have. Does our society protect our children enough from evil predators like this? I think it's hard when this monster had no previous convictions. 
Those who blend amongst us, the wolves in sheep's clothing, will always be the biggest danger. Holly is still remembered by the people of Toronto, after a mural was made in the local Sororan Park. Her mother Maria, has created Holly's garden at her home. It's filled with flowers and twinkling lights, a place she finds comfort in remembering her daughter. What are your thoughts on this tragic case? Leave your comments below. And thank you for watching, it would really help my channel grow if you gave the video a thumbs up, and consider subscribing, as we post true crime videos on a weekly basis.